there seems to be uh, uh, some controversy about um, uh, about this drag area. Uh, there has been some speculation among designers around the country, uh, at least two that I'm aware of, uh, who have predicted that uh, no one was going to be able to get below a square foot of drag area, or that they didn't, they weren't aware of anyone who had gotten below a square foot of drag area. This airplane is around. It is well below mm -hmm. a square foot of drag mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. um, uh, is, and I've been telling people that the airplane has the lowest drag of any airplane in the world that we know about. Is that, is that an outlandish uh, assumption? Yeah. Um, on drag area, I do not know of any um, calculated numbers on drag area that are below one square feet. It's very possible that the latest Formula A racers, like Bummer's Bullet and the Nemesis. Formula One racer. Yeah. Formula, yeah. It's possible that those racers um, are getting close um, to it now. They're a little bigger, air, they're about the same wing area, but they're a heavier airplane and they've got more power. Uh, the stock engine, 100 horsepower, and I guess they get 130 horsepower out of them. But they're starting to make qualifying speeds of over 250 miles an hour. And so um, if I had more data on those planes, um, uh, if I knew what their power was and what their propeller efficiency was, we could work that back and see how close they're getting to the magic square foot. But that was always the goal. Could we make a man-carrying airplane of any type that would have as low a drag area as one square foot? Because that is a product of the size of the airplane and its cleanliness. But now it'd be kind of nice to know, what do we know about cleanliness? You know, separate from the fact that it's a small airplane. Take the size out of it, and then we could even compare it with fighters and transports and jet airplanes and everything else. But you have a way to do and that. And there is a way to do that. And all you got to do is, since the drag area has a units of square feet, all you got to do is, is divide by um, a significant area of the airplane in square feet. And the best one to do, in the old days everybody divided by the projected wing area. But that isn't fair because uh, it, it's um, um, the number you get is a function of how big the fuselage is compared to the wing, for example. So the right number to use is the total wetted area, every bit of the surface of the airplane that the air is scrubbing by. And you and I got a pretty good guess of what, or a good, good calculation of what the wetted area of the airplane is. Okay, when I take the same assumptions on the horsepower and on the propeller efficiency, I get these wetted area coefficients all the way from um, 00363, uh, the lowest value with the low propeller efficiency and low power, up to about 004. Um, on the uh, higher power and the higher propeller efficiency. Well, what does that number mean? What can we compare it with? Okay, we're talking about a propeller-driven airplane with cooling drag problems. And there was an airplane once, the P-51 Mustang, and the reason it was make that long range into Germany and back, not only was because of the drop tanks, but because it, it had a very low uh, drag configuration. Uh, although it had low drag airfoils, very similar to what you've used here, with a metal construction, they really weren't getting the help from laminar flow. But they were faster, bigger airplanes, so the Reynolds number was higher. This helps bring the, even the turbine boundary air drag value down. But the other thing they had going for it was that they had worked out a cooling system where they had either zero cooling drag or a little bit of thrust by very carefully how they took the air in how they uh, diffused it to a low speed before it hit and brought the pressure up before it hit the radiator, and then how they uh, handled the exit um, and added some heat to the process. And, made a little jet. And they made a little jet, and you know, the thing came out to crap about zero cooling drag. And these tests were done at Ames, by the way, way back. They did uh, some pretty fantastic glide tests for that airplane in addition to power tests, and they found that. So, um, that airplane has a wetted area coefficient, including the cooling drag, of 004, which is the size and number that you're a little below. And, uh, from so our, this from our best has, estimates, has yeah. less drag uh, than the P-51. Yes, uh, if you take its its drag uh, at its high speed and you divide by the surface area of the airplane, then the drag and per unit of surface area of this airplane is a little bit better than the. 51, in spite of the fact that you've obviously got cooling drag. With and I have a fixed gear hanging out there And you've got a well. fixed landing gear, yeah, but very clean. Now, with a retractable landing gear, uh, you don't always win. First of all, you add weight. And secondly, uh, you're going to chop the wing up. 
to retract the gear into them. And it's almost impossible to make those doors fit as flush as, for example, your canopy fit is and your inspection plate fits. Mm -hmm. these, are, these are fabulous, these fits. Thank you, Bruce. That's another. How did you do that? Well, I, I'm telling them about it in the movie. Okay, good. All right. I'll tell you all about it. Yeah, good. Bye. Well, that's, um, that's very interesting. Uh, P-51's always been my favorite airplane, or one of my favorite airplanes. And, uh, mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, we're, we mentioned the P-51 when we talked about interference drag a little bit uh, yes. later on, talking about that, that uh, high peak on the exhaust streak that, mm -hmm. I, that I talked to you about. Yes. Mm -hmm. P-51 exhibits that a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, the amazing thing is, is that it took so long for the power plane designers to really start believing that they could use uh, some of these techniques that were developed by the sailplane uh, builders and manufacturers and really make them pay off. And they always thought, yeah, but we've got a powered airplane and we've got a propeller and, and you know, gee, is it really worth, worth well, it? And I also but think there was a great deal of resistance to using composite construction on powered yeah. airplanes. Mm -hmm. I've run into that a lot, yep. and mm -hmm. of course, if you use composite construction, you can get those long laminar runs. Mm -hmm. and you can keep the surface waviness down enough to right. get that. So. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. Well, um, Bruce, have I told you how much I like you? <laughs> <laughs> Feelings mutual. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, is there anything else I can't? I can't think of anything else that I wanted to have.